And Lord, we thank you for this study. Uh, over, at least for me, over 20 years of being with these great men as we have grown and have sought you uh, in your word. We ask God that again this morning you would make the scriptures sing and penetrate our lives for your glory. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Okay, Psalm 88. I want to tell you what a psalm. Uh, I was, uh, I'm always surprised with what God has in the Psalter. And this was another important but beautiful uh, a, a psalm um, in the third book of the five books of the Psalter. By way of introduction, Psalm 88 is a lament psalm from the sons of Korah, and we've seen this in Psalm 42 through 49, and 84 and 85, and now in Psalm 88. Um, you can see the background of the, of the sons of Korah from Numbers 16, 1 through 13 in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 19. And as we look at the superscription, we are not sure what Mahalalah Linanot means in Hebrew. One possible meaning is uh, humble or afflicted according to Golden Gay, as commentary among others. The superscription is also states that this is a maskel, or a contemplative poem of Her Haman the Ezraite. Now, Haman was a sage, or a, a person who had a man of wisdom, according to 1 Kings 4.31, and a musician and a prophet of Solomon's time. And he is linked to the sons of Korah, according to 1 Chronicles 6, 33-38 in the English text. There is also Haman that is called the sons of Zarah in 1 Chronicles 2, 6. I also believe that's the English address there. What is unusual about the psalm is the stark absence of praise or the confidence of God's comfort and or deliverance in the time of great need. And many have concluded, and I think I, I would be one of those also, that this is the saddest psalm in the Psalter. It seems to be a prayer in a Job-like situation. So, with that, let's begin with the outline of the psalm. Uh, many have outlined this psalm um, with two uh, divisions, but I and a few others have done with three. His condition, which he speaks about, uh, prayer for his deliverance, and then prayer in a long-term suffering. And so... I believe that will help us. So let's look at the first uh, nine verses, or nine and a half, as you say. If I've split verse nine uh, because of its topical understandings. And we come to his condition, a prayer to the Lord concerning the lifelong death affliction. Did you hear that? Lifelong. This is what makes this psalm uh, kind of just jump out at you. If you if if you thought it was a period of time that then it was through, but this seems to be very long, uh, if not his entire life. And he begins with his persistent prayer. If you'll see where he says in verse one that he is petitioning persistently day and night. There is your mirrorism, uh, a figure of speech that gives you 
a, a, a starting point and an ending point, but means everything in between. So he is praying at all times because evidently of the pain and the difficulty of his situation. And he's again asking God, typical of what we would all ask, right? For deliverance. Uh, my translation says salvation, but salvation is a deliverance, right? Uh, doesn't ha uh, especially in the psalm doesn't mean that it's just merely spiritual. In this context, it is concentrated on the physical. He needs physical deliverance in the sense of healing. And he needs an answer in this. So, O oh Lord, the God of of my salvation, I have cried by day and in the night before you. So, in a sense, all the time. For he's constantly in, in it. He then says in verse 2, Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. Answer in deliverance, God. Um, you know that this is foremost on his mind because he doesn't wait right out of the bat the first two verses this is what I need God my, my situation is dire and then in verses 3 through 5 his condition is stated and the reason for his condition um, in, in verse 3 my soul is in persistent trouble if you're physically in, uh, have difficulties, then you're going to have spiritual difficulty. Um, and then he says in the second half of verse 3, my life is near Sheol, which here in context would be near death. Uh, as we have said many times, the word Sheol is broad. Depending on the context, it can mean the place where people go when they die. Uh, or it can be talk about the grave or death itself. So I think probably here, my life is near death, near Sheol. And fourth, uh, I, am, uh, I am reckoned among those who go down to the pit. Uh, I have become like a man without strength. So he's headed to the pit, another name for the death and the grave. Uh, he's a man without strength because of the prolonged uh, condition that he is in and it just completely has worn him down. If you've been in any type of situation for any period of time, it just uh, that deals with uh, pain uh, it wears you down. I just talked to someone last night that has had a condition for 10 years and a debilitating condition and how easy to wear you down. It's easy in that situation to sin by uh, in complaining in such a way that it's not biblical. There's nothing wrong with telling God, I'm in pain, I'm in trouble, I need your help. But how do we do that? And with what do we lash out to those who are trying to help uh, because of our pain? So a man without strength, a man that near the pit, verse 5, forsaken and slain among the dead. So he says, forsaken among the dead like the slain who lie in the grave whom you have remembered no more and they have cut, uh, are cut off from your hand? Do you feel him? Do you sense that in the midst of his constant, continued pain that he believes God doesn't remember him? How easy to come to that conclusion in such as this. And I'm remembered no more by you, God, because I'm still in pain. He's cut off from God. Now, he really isn't, but that's how he feels because nothing has come 
to relieve him in these situations? Do you, do you sense it a little bit of his condition? And his, maybe you can think back in your life where you were there in just a little while. I want you to understand the, the, the situation here seemed to be almost lifelong. It's, this has been his life as he comes before God. And the Lord is the source of his plight. Notice um, all uh, uh, are descriptions of being dead in verse 6. The lowest pit, the dark place, in the depth. So I'll read the verse 6. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the dark places, in the depths. Do you feel him? God's rage is upon him is in the ver- first half of verse 7. God's waves of affliction. Not, uh, uh, not one wave. Not one particular time, but waves of affliction. To the extent that, verse 8, his friend, uh, it sense that God is afflicting him, so they loathe and forsake him. So now he doesn't have any friends. He's talking about being alone. You have removed my acquaintances far from me. It's, you have made me an object of loathing them. Did you notice starting with verse 6 through the first half of verse 9 that he puts the subject you? He's speaking to God. God, you did this. That's, uh, that's, that's difficult, isn't it? In one sense, uh, we must say he's correct. Nothing happens in this universe unless God allows it to happen. And yet, um, God always has a purpose. But we don't always know what it is. And so, therefore, we contend with him at times. And he does tolerate us. Um, And what is often in a a situation like this, um, failing health and loss of vitality and loss of hope is to begin to lash out at God. And yet, we all know from the Scriptures, at least, in this Bible study, I would think, that, God, you're in absolute control and work all things for the good, but all things are not good, right? But he works it for the good, but you don't, in a situation, you may not know what it is. So the, knowing you don't see what it is or how it's working out, you have to believe that by faith. And if you don't believe that by faith, do you think you might be lashing out at God? You think he might be blaming God? You say, Lord, you got the, you've got all the power. Oh, how easy to begin to blame God and, and to accuse him because he's in control. So I thought it would be wise at this time, especially, brothers, when we find ourselves in this and when we counsel people who are in this, that we have verses that may uh, at least help in our theology. I find that even though you know what is theologically correct, when you are in these kinds of situations, the question is, do you have the maturity to live through it? Or shall I say, live in the light of your knowledge? That will be key. So, One of the verses that I have 
used over the years is Proverbs chapter 6, verse 14. Um, Proverbs 6, 14, For the Lord has made everything for His or its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Oh, my. Oh, my. You mean God is in control of wicked people? And he allows wickedness to happen? Are, are those wicked people responsible? Oh, of course. They're doing exactly what they want to do. But is God going to bring all things, even the evil things, according to his purpose? Though we don't see it, we don't understand it. And then people begin to question God's righteousness and justice. And my first statement to people is, you want justice now or throughout eternity? Because one day at the judgment seat, every crooked will be made straight. Every, just, every evil will be judged eternally. And righteousness will reign throughout eternity. And I hear people, yeah, I know, I know, but I want it now. Well, I'd rather have it throughout eternity if I had to have a choice. And so we must trust God about the evil things that happen. For he's in control, and but we may, uh, I guarantee you, we will not understand it because we don't see it all. And we don't live long enough to see how he brings it to glory. Now, I had to turn to Ecclesiastes, which is after the book of Proverbs, in chapter 3, that wonderful section of found in the book of Ecclesiastes, there is an appointed time. Did you hear that? Who appoints that time? God does. There is an appointed time for everything. And there is a time for every event under heaven. He's saying, I control all. And then he begins in verses 2 through 8 to give what we call mirrorism. Uh, a mirrorism, as we let me just read the first one here in verse two: time to give birth and a time to die. Well, he's not talking about just when a person's born, and he's not just talking about uh, that he died; that all the events under heaven are determined. He he's putting those two points to help you to say that everything in between is in his control, also. So he just says. A time to give birth and time to die. When, when we die and they put a tombstone over us, it says date such and such, dash, date such and such, right? When you were born and when you died and your life is, the, <laughs> is represented by what? A dash. And I always like to say at this point, how did you live your dash? How did you live your dash? So God is in control of all of those things. And then he begins, because he talks about an appointed time, everything, there is a time, events under heaven. And then he begins to tell you about all these different events, time to plant, a time to uproot, and everything in between. Time to kill and time to heal, and everything in between. Um... Time to tear down and time to build up. You know the passage in Scripture. Do you, are you with me? So God is in control of all of these things. And you say, well, I don't understand it all. Well, join the group, okay? Because nobody does but God. The question is, will you trust him? Even when it doesn't feel good and you don't know. And then... Notice verse uh, um, 9 and following in Ecclesiastes 3. What profit is there to the worker from which, uh, that in which he toils? I have seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. He has made everything, depends on your translation, appropriate. It could be beautiful. In its time. 
in its time. All we see is an ugly situation, an evil situation, and we have no idea how that evil situation fits in all the plan of God and everything else that's involved in all of life. But one day you will, and you will testify just like this psalmist, uh, this uh, Solomon does. Yeah, he did it beautifully, appropriately. I get to see the whole context now. Whoa, wow. I didn't see it then. He made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the works of God is, has done from the beginning to the end. You can't know. <laughs> he may give you some glimpses in glory. I know, verse 12, that there's nothing better uh, uh, for them than to rejoice and do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. And if you do that, guess what he says? It's a gift from God. How easy in this evil world to say, man, this is the pit. This is destruction. This is bad. This is evil. And all of it's true. But if you take your work, God, this is what you lotted me to do. This is what you ordained me to do. And I'm going to take it to honor you. And if you do it that way, guess what? This vanity that we're going through because of the curse of the sin will not be vanity as much as a gift of God because we will say, yeah, that's sin, that's vanity, but this was a gift from God. That is good. It's a perspective. And pain and uh, sickness uh, can all warp our are thinking about what's happening in the world from from a, a believer's should be a believer's perspective. Uh, I was thinking as I was going through this, uh, Joni Erickson Tata, who at 16 years old was going swimming, jumped in, uh, went too deep, bumped her back of her neck and snapped her uh, uh, spinal cord and became a quadriplegic for the rest of her life. <laughs> wow. She wakes up to it every day. And how she, by God's grace, has handled that through the pain and the difficulty and the testimony of the greatness of her God. In chapter 7 of the book of Ecclesiastes, verse 13 uh, and 14, Consider the work of God, for who is able to straighten what he has bent? I can't tell you how many years ago I looked at that text and I go, wait a minute, surely, surely that's wrong. Isn't it the other way? You know, I would want, you know, if I was right now, I would say, consider the work of God who is able to bend what God has straightened. No. God reaches down in our lives and he bends things. Isn't that something? Or allows the evil one to bend things. Interesting. For who is able to straighten what he has bent? In the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, that's a real nice translation. Really, the day of evil. Be told, be good, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other so that man may not discover anything that will come after him. You may you may investigate all you can and you say, I just can't figure out why this happened to me. That just doesn't make sense. 
And Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes is saying, <laughs> I told you, trust God. Trust God. And the psalmist in Psalm 88 is bringing this out. He's, he's bringing out the pain. Ecclesiastes is giving me the theology. And Psalm 88 is bringing out the pain of it. Romans 8, 28. And we know, do we? That God works everything for the good for, for those who are called according to his purpose. And that's, that's meat and potatoes for me. I, I have had to say that so many times in my life. So, back in, in Psalm uh, 88, he has concentrated on God as doing all these things. But God is the one who's in sovereign control and will work it for the good. I'm not saying it is good. He will work it for good. And so we need to trust him. Now, Psalm 88, 9 through 12, the Lord's deliverance will glorify him. Uh, exclamation through rhetorical questions. This is a weird section. You know what a rhetorical question is. He suggests how answering his prayers will bring God glory. It's a weird way we would think it, but it's a figure of speech. It's a way to expressing yourself. Uh, to, he wants to bring forth glory of God by saying, listen, God, if, if you don't heal me in doing this, then I can't do that in praising you like I want. If he did, and he's just using these kinds of uh, what we would call rhetorical statements. So I've interpreted those in rhetorical questions for you in 9 through 12 of the psalm. Uh, in, when I, six rhetorical questions. In verse 10, if he dies, the Lord's wonders will not be displayed through him. And uh, the word wonders, if you notice in verse 12a, is also brought out. It's that Hebrew word pele, which uh, uh, it was a key word for the New Exodus theme of my dissertation. And uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's here, but it always <laughs> plucks my mind as a possibility. If he dies, the living will not hear his praise uh, about the Lord. If, uh, in verse 11, if he dies, people will not say the Lord's loving kindness is chesed through him. Well, well they won't see it. Can God do it differently? Sure he could, but he's doing it from his perspective. If he dies, the living will not see the Lord's faithfulness and deliverance from Abaddon, which is destruction through him. Could God do something else to it? Sure he could, but that's his perspective now as he looks at these things. If he dies, the living will not see God's faithful love and his wondrous works through his life. And finally, if he dies, the living will not see the Lord's righteous acts realized and remembered through his life. So all these questions, based, based, rhetorical statements basically, uh, come forth, God from these de dealing with these uh, uh, interesting thing that he is going through. Now, prayer in long-term suffering, his persistent prayer in his long, devastating times, uh, a puzzling part of persevering prayer. Notice verse 13. But I, O oh Lord, have cried out to you for help. And in the morning my prayer comes before you. I'm sure it's in the evening too, huh? Prayer in the morning, a puzzling thing in verse 14. Why God 
rejects his soul. He, he, because he's, prayer is not being answered, he thinks his soul is rejected. Is that something would be common in an illness like this? Absolutely. Puzzling thing in the latter part of verse 14. Why God seems to be to hide his answer? Well, his answer may be, well, I want to live through you this situation instead of deliver you out of this situation. The puzzling part of persevering prayer. Yeah, I'm a preacher. And I think those are what he's talking about in verses 13 and 14. And then the last section dealing with prayer and a long time suffering, his persistent prayer in his long devastating times. And this is where we see, uh, I should say, one of the saddest things I've ever seen in a psalm, ending in a psalm. Continued affliction. He's about to die from his youth. This is not something that just came upon him. Verse 15 says that he has been this from his youth. I was afflicted and about to die from my youth on. Woo. We don't know how old he is, but he's not in his youth anymore. The effects of his suffering. He calls it a terror of suffering in verse 15. Suffer your terrors. I'm overcome. So his emotional and mental state is, I I'm done. I'm toast. And then in verse 16 and following, God's anger seems to be over me. God's terror destroyed me. This is how he feels. God's horror is like a flood that surrounds me. He feels defeated and isolated because lover, friend, and acquaintance basically abandoned him. I am suffering. I'm suffering a long time. It doesn't make sense. I cry out to God. He doesn't answer. My friends sense it. They don't want to be around me. They finally don't come. I am alone. And that's how the psalm ends. Let me read it. Beginning with verse 16. Um, what shall I say? 15. I was afflicted. And about to die from my youth on. I suffered your terrors. I'm overcome. Your burning anger has passed over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. They have surrounded me like water all day long. They have encompassed me altogether. You have removed lover and friend far from me. My acquaintances are in darkness. And when you finish it, you kind of go, is, is, is that it? Aren't you going to say, but, 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 you came? But, but, you, you sustained me? Do you see why so many people say this is the saddest psalm in the Psalter? It is as though he leaves you with no hope. He wants you to see, you say, well, why would God do this? Uh, I don't know for sure, but um, um, my thoughts are that um, he wants, wants people to know the emotional strain that you're gonna, a person will have in this situation. And there are so many other Psalms that you could turn to to get hope. Now, I felt like it's important for me at this point to make a statement. The author of this psalm has well described the possible devastating condition in life from a human perspective. The effects of Adamic sin and personal sins cause physical and deterioration of life. 
and the attacks on our mental and spiritual attitude. If you are physically <laughs> sick, you're going to be bombarded spiritually and mentally. This is a reality that we need to take note of, but this suffering is not what we need to resign ourselves to live under as a defeated Christian if or when it comes. Suffering like this is a stark reminder to live and meditate on the glory of God. That which I'm experiencing is not what I'm going to have. And the more I have mentally and emotionally and spiritually uh, placed in my soul of the glory of God, the, the, the easier I will be able to get through these type of unbelievable situations if God places you in it. So, let's look at one passage in 2 Corinthians 4. Verse 8. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 8. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I, I think this would be a good... Uh, passage to turn to, huh? After reading this. Going all the way down, I love to, to exposit this. Uh, this may be my text uh, in March 30th for my chapel message at CBS. But notice um, verse six, 16 of 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore we do not lose heart, but through, though our outer man is decaying, greatly described in Psalm 88. Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison while we look not at the things which are seen but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal. So let's meditate and remind ourselves of the eternal truth that is ours. And that will help in the midst of the devastating experiences of life. Glory should be the meat and potatoes of our life every day. Because the more we are thinking of glory through our situation, the better we will respond to God in glory or giving Him glory. So what would I say this psalm is about? <clears throat> Desiring to glorify God in prolonged, devastating situations will cause the saint to pray, trust God, <clears throat> even when the discouraging circumstances of life continues. <clears throat> Application, <clears throat> one of many. Throughout the agony of a prolonged affliction, the faithful never give up hope that God may answer their prayers and give them enduring faith as they live life under the affliction to the glory of God. What a psalm, huh? Well, let me pray and we can do a few questions or discussions. Lord, thank you. A difficult psalm, Lord. Uh, hopefully we've put it in the right context so that we may benefit from it, Lord. This life under the curse of sin should cause us to meditate on the glory of Christ. 
which will be ours for eternity. It is that that will help us most in the midst of living in the life of cursed from sin on this earth. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.